Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar Explained or Avatar Discussion Topic video. Uh, this one is going to be all about pro bending. Uh, specifically, this is one of my Patreon uh, requested videos. This one is from Brittany who chose this topic. Uh, so thank you to her for supporting me on Patreon and allowing this topic to happen. So I'm going to start off here with this first section of just explaining the basics of pro bending and I'm going to use the pro bending arena board game here to explain it in a bit more of a kind of visual way than just kind of typing out a bunch of rules on slides and stuff like that. So um, again I'm just using the game as an example. What I'm going to show you here is suppose, how the game actually works in the show. So here's the setup, here's like the arena and then you can see on the outside of the arena it's an extend, it's a elevated platform above kind of water. So the aim of the game of course is to from your side of the arena kind of push your opponent back enough to eventually knock them off the back of the arena or win by just getting pure territory uh, by winning across the rounds and having your opponent be pushed back. So the main rules of pro bending to start off with are that it's a team of three on each side. Each team has to have a fire bender, a water bender, and an earth bender on, their, on your team. You have to have one of each. You can't have two of any one element or anything like that. It has to be three and it has to be three of each of the three main elements. Of course, air be but at the time the game was invented, of course, there wasn't really that many air benders in the world. and Really, it's only as of like the end of the series where there probably are enough airbenders, but we'll discuss that idea about an airbending expansion for pro bending later on. Uh, the first things to get across here are that this is how the game starts off. You've got, of course, your center line and the two halves of the arena, and of course, each team starts on either side. They have to start in the kind of uh, zone closest to the center line but they can choose to basically line up wherever they want. They can group up really close together or they can all be over one side if they want. But of course, just for the sake of actually starting off well, it probably is the best tactic to just kind of square off one-on-one, -on -one, choose your matchups at the start and then see where the game goes once you get going. Um, then I suppose, where do you get your elements from? So the firebenders are covered. They create their own element. Water bending is the kind of more complicated one. They get their water from inside these grates. So specifically, water benders are allowed to get water from either, for Korra here, this is Korra. She's allowed to take water out of the grate in front of her here, or directly behind her, but she's not allowed to take water out from this one over here, behind Tano, or any of the arenas back here. Unless, say she's pushed back into this zone, then she's allowed to take water out of the grate here, and here. And then it's a specific rule that you're not allowed to bend water from um, the kind of outside of the arena. It's just the water that is within the grates here on the arena. Um, for earthbenders, of course, they also need a, a supply of their element. As you can see here on Bolin, he has this earth disc, and that is what the earthbenders have to bend. That is the only earth that they are allowed to bend are the specific earth discs that are supplied within the arena. This uh, board doesn't show them, but the idea is that like scattered across all of the zones, there are like dispensers with stacked earth discs. Um, that kind of have that same sort of pattern as like that, you can see there. Circles with a square hole in the middle, and they're sort of made of a kind of clay-like substance. Uh, it might even actually just be clay. It, it, they specifically say they're like rock discs, so they're probably a little harder than that uh, to get the impact that's needed, but they're specifically made so that they don't like, they're not going to viciously hurt someone who gets hit by them. But the idea is that there's, it seems to be a borderline unlimited amount and that like, we've never seen a situation where they've ran out of uh, earth discs, but there's some here in the, all of the different zones, so it's not that they'll ever be without it. Again, the rule is that the earthbender has to bend the discs that are within their zone. So they can't bend discs from their opponent's zone or the ones behind them until they actually get into that zone uh, and so on. So, that, so that's the, the, the basic idea. It's a three round match, but it can end within the first round because um, 
the idea is that you win the match immediately, say the fire ferrets um, manage to just completely knock everyone out the back of the arena, they're in the water. They don't just win the first round, they win the complete game because they scored a triple knockout. Uh, so that results in them basically getting two round points, which means they win the match. There's no need to play anything more. Um, but a standard game would probably go something like, you know, say the, the fire ferret to push the wolf bats back this zone. This allows them to do what's called a zone advance. So they'd all move up. There's a temporary break in play as the fire ferrets move up. The game then resumes like this. If the round timer ends with the match like this, Fire Ferrets are obviously playing this way, so they have the be the better territory. They they're up into like four zones, whereas the Wolf Bats are obviously pushed back only two zones. They only have two zones basically, so that means the Fire Ferrets would win this round based off territory. And that would be one round point. Uh, another important thing to note is that you can knock out just individual members of the team and have the match still continue. So say for instance, this guy got knocked off and it's just these two left. There's no extra advantage here as such for the Fire Ferrets. They still would win the round with just one point. Um, they just have, I suppose, a better chance towards the end of the round about trying to knock out only two people left with the person advantage. Um, he will come back for the start of round two. Uh, the, the, the only way that you just get someone completely kind of uh, out of the match and the match still continue is if someone gets a red fan, red card basically, and is uh, basically excluded from the match or if they're injured and can't continue anymore. There are no substitutions, so you're just down a player. And that is, that's like most of the core of the game. There are other specific rules where, of course, um, if you've seen the show, of course, there are ropes all along the sides of the arena, but they sort of stop here. So it's just the back area that's open. You're not allowed to knock your opponent off the sides over the ropes. Uh, they're there to basically stop that happening. And it's a penalty if you force that to happen, basically. So... Um, other than that, I suppose it's just specific examples of, I suppose, how things work of like um, the territory, the, ter the, the, the zone advance, as it's called, only happens when there is basically an empty zone between opponents. So say the wolf bats pushed Bolin back here. There is still a fire ferret fighting in the zone directly in front of the wolf bats. So it doesn't, they can't advance forward. Even if Korra gets knocked back and it's only Mako here, he is still holding this zone for the, the fire ferrets here. So they can't advance forward. Uh, it's only when they actually knock Mako back that then that's when the break in play happens and the wolf bats are allowed to advance forward, all advance forward into this zone. Another example of that is to just, uh, let's just kind of reset that play and say Mako's here. Let's say the situation we actually have is like, like this. Tano's holding the initial zone here. Mako is also here. So no one gets a zone advance. Uh, but then you have the Earthbender for the Wolfbat in the middle zone and the Firebender for the Wolfbat in the final zone. What happens when Tano knocks Mako back here? So say this happens. There is, a, there is a line advance, zone advance, that's allowed to happen here. But what happens with the break and play that happens here is that everyone's allowed to come up. Even, if, even though he's back more zones and even though he's all the way back here, he comes back all the way up here. That's the advantage that they earn from doing that. So, you know, you're still in the fight and that's the significance of still fighting even though you're all the way here at the back. So, um... That's kind of an important thing to note. And then of course, you know, you're allowed to kind of, I suppose, fight back. Say the, the fire ferrets push these guys back here. They're allowed to advance forward then here to sort of reset the zones and so on. And then obviously the question then is what happens if the match ends in a tie? So if the match ends with like no one really gaining advantage, if it's just, okay, dead even, what happens then is that there's a coin flip. The team that wins the coin flip is allowed to choose an element. And it's basically a one-on-one -on -one match between that the benders of that element on the team. 
So we, we obviously saw this happen in the show. So let's say for instance, the fire ferret win the coin flip, they choose water. So what happens is that these guys go out to the side and it's Korra versus Tano. And then specifically, they don't show it on this because the tiebreaker isn't really a part of the uh, the game here. But there's a, there's a circular section right here in the middle, much smaller arena basically. And the idea is that Korra and Tano fight in that circular, much smaller arena up close. And the first person to knock the other off that little podium, basically, that's in the middle here wins. The only major difference in the tiebreaker than the standard thing is that they are allowed to sort of kind of circle around each other. So the direct, I suppose, line of half and half doesn't matter. It is just a circular arena and they're allowed to sort of... Uh, brawl with each other with the aim of just knocking each other off any part of that circle. The other thing is that they're allowed to grapple. So they're not allowed to punch and kick each other uh, just like physically without using uh, bending, but they are allowed to like kind of grapple and like throw each other uh, as well as use their elements. So that is an extra kind of uh, situation that you have here. And the idea is that of course, that is how you uh, win the tiebreaker. Say Korra knocks Tano off, which we saw happen. She wins that round in the tiebreaker for the Fire Ferrets. Uh, they do specify in the rules that if it ends in a tie, say both fall off and both hit the ground at the same time in the outside. What happens is that you continue with the tiebreaker. It's just that the, the team that won, I think, gets to choose the next element. So, okay, Waterbenders ended in the draw. It's Earthbenders up next. And if they finish it and so on. I don't think they specify if there is a situation for what happens if all, all the elements kind of go through. I assume you just keep cycling through a one-on-one -on -one matches between the elements until you finally do get a victor. So um, we've never seen a crazy situation like that because the first one-on-one -on -one has always ended it but uh, that is the idea that uh, they're kind of going for here so um that i think is the main thing to talk about just in terms of the general kind of gist of how it all works um uh, other than that like it's it's the stuff that i'm going to cover when i cut to the rest of the video is like very specific rules for specific elements specific fouls and stuff like that that can happen in that, um, I suppose a quick example of that here is something that Cora did, where she was in her first match and before she knew the rules, she did a crazy flip move and hit someone. But as she landed, she stepped forward over the line before there was an actual zone advance. That's called a foot fault penalty. And the penalty that Cora suffers is that she is sent back one zone. So the game temporarily stops. She's, she has to start from here and the match resumes again. Similarly, uh, Cora got a couple of uh, penalties as well for uh, abusing and throwing water at the referee. She got a yellow card for that, and I think she was also pushed back in the zone again. Um, and there's other stuff like that. Like some of the, the penalties that the wolf bats uh, weren't called on, uh, like Tano using ice, that would probably be a yellow card offense, and he'd be pushed back a zone. Um, stuff like uh, the, the earthbender crushed up some of the earth discs, which you're not meant to do. And they did headshots as well with uh, water and earth, which you're not meant to do. They'd all be like yellow uh, car defenses and they'd be pushed back zones as well. And borderline, some of them would probably be red cards as well for um, the, the wolf bats. But uh, that's, that's, I think, the, the, the main thing to talk about here. Um, in all of this there's a lot of very specific probably edge case rules that are kind of very difficult to cover uh, but that's the the basic idea as well and um, so uh, yeah I'm just gonna cut now and you'll see my thoughts on some of the rules and we we'll get into some of the teams and some speculation as well but uh, yeah that has been the initial demonstration of just the zone advancing and stuff like that and how the game actually works if you've seen the show you probably roughly understand how it all works but uh, that is the explanation here okay so we've covered the basics of i suppose how pro bending is played how the zone type stuff works how you win uh, gain advantages and so on let's now get into some of the specific uh, rules of the game 
uh, because there are some pretty interesting specific rules with how it's played. So we'll start with the bender specific rules here, and we'll start with water bender specific rules here. So um, water bending probably has one of the the most amount of like special things related to it. So um, water bending strikes cannot last more than one second. What 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 that means is that you can't just relentlessly like stream or fire water at someone and just you know completely keep them like keep water firing at them your strike has to be like i suppose the idea of this is to make it a the the, the entire i suppose aim in a way of a lot of the rules of pro bending is to make all of the strikes somewhat similar of like you are throwing a thing and because of the one second duration it allows for a little bit of leeway it allows for skill to play a role but fundamentally only allows you know the amount of water you can throw at someone to be a certain amount because of that. Uh, with water bending only liquid form, so you can only use water as a liquid. You can't turn it into ice or steam or mist or anything like that. So you have to keep it as water. Because of that rule, water benders can aim strikes at the head, um, which is a very notable thing for them. And then the uh, main, I suppose, zoning rule for waterbenders is that waterbenders can only use water from the grates at the front or the back of the zone that they're in. So they can only take water uh, that's in the grate directly in front of them or directly behind them. You can take it from, like, the zone all the way in the back of your one, and you can take it from uh, the grate, say, like, behind your opponent in the zone in front of you or anything like that. So that is an important kind of uh, one to kind of keep in mind. So we'll move from there into uh, firebender specific rules. Uh, fire strikes cannot last more than one second. So this is the same rule as before. The sort of uh, hosing or uh, streaming rule of you can't just flamethrower someone forever. It has to be like fire blast. And if they, if they take the hit basically for longer than the second, it is a penalty. So the idea is that you're meant to fire a very specific blast of fire at them. Uh, no fire strikes to the head are allowed in the game. It's a penalty if that happens. Uh, and then, all, of course, no lightning or combustion bending is allowed. And then similarly with water bending, I didn't include it there. But the idea is like a lot of those other specialized techniques aren't really allowed. So no blood bending, of course. But, you know, some of those are quite specific. And, and it's the same case here of like it's standard fire bending. So no lightning or combustion bending. Um, earth bender specific rules. So no earth strikes to the head. No metal or lava bending. Earthbenders can only bend the supplied earth discs in the arena and only from the zone that they're currently in. So there's a bunch of uh, these kind of dispensers with the earth, earth discs on the floor. You can only bend them from the dispensers that are in your zone that you're currently in. So you can't do it in your opponent's zone or behind you or anything like that. It has to be just in your zone. Uh, earthbenders are not allowed to break up the discs into rubble or anything like that they must be used as they are you know you fire a solid thing if they break up after that uh, that's you know if they break on contact that's i suppose what they're meant to do basically but they are you're not allowed to break them up yourself to kind of make them sharp or anything like that or turn them into dust and do sand bending type stuff uh, you are allowed to take multiple discs at once and use them how you wish. You can also uh, bounce them or ricochet them off the, the ropes that are around the ring as well. So um, there are the specific earthbender and so on bending rules. There are some specific avatar rules as well, which is a kind of fun little thing. The avatar is allowed to play pro bending as long as they only bend one element and also do not use the avatar state. This created a new foul within the game, specific to the avatar, where if an avatar does bend an element other than their specific role on the team, uh, if they do that, they're sent back a zone as kind of punishment. Uh, repeated infringements will of course result in a yellow and then potentially a red fan if that continues to go on. So the idea of this is of course Cora is the water bender on her team in pro bending. She's only allowed to use water if she uses fire or earth or even air. That is a penalty against her and it's specific to her because she's the only, there's only one avatar at one point in time. Um, let's go into fouls now and some of the other specific ones that we have here. So we've, we've covered some of these ones already with the idea of like head strikes and breaking a lot of the bending specific rules like icing if you turn water into ice and that sort of stuff. Um, 
most obvious one is, is a foot fault. So this is if someone steps over a line either in front or behind them. It is that is considered basically you lose a zone. So if you step forward, um, even just a little bit into the zone in front of you, that's a penalty. You got your sent back a zone. If you step back. The idea is, of course, just by the rules of the game, that is considered you kind of giving up that zone as if you were pushed back. So it's a foot fault uh, and you go back a zone as well. Um, it is a foul if you give either physical or verbal abuse to the referee. Uh, similarly, physical or verbal abuse to the audience. Uh, also, it's a very specific one here. Hitting the arena uh, roof with an attack, that's also a foul. Uh, as is knocking your opponent out over the sides of the arena. The aim is to knock them out the back of the arena. Uh, and, the, and also another rule here is striking your opponent with a punch or kick that is not like like a direct bending attack here. So the idea is that like, uh, in, in some cases like you are very close. If, if, if two opposing team, people on opposing teams are right up against the line of the zone where they're kind of competing for... They are within like striking distance, like physically of each other, even without using bending. Uh, as far as we're aware, the rules are that you can't just, you know, punch them or kick them or anything like that. You have to use your element to do that um, and so on. Uh, this also applies in the uh, tiebreaker as well, in that the tiebreaker allows you to grapple as well as use your bending but you are not allowed to just punch or kick or do that like no, no physical striking basically uh, but the grappling is allowed grappling isn't allowed in the standard game before you get into the tiebreaker um, also attacking your opponent during a break in play is not allowed Cora got pe penalized for what was it called uh, roughing an opponent where she started like messing messing with them with water bending when she was frustrated so that's also considered a penalty so um, the results of these getting penalties like this and fouls called against you are that repeated minor fouls or serious fouls can result in a player receiving a yellow or on occasion a red fan. Yellow fan is a warning and more fouls after this may earn you a red fan. A red fan results in an immediate ejection of that player from the match. They will not return for any rounds remaining in the match. So this isn't just like you are gone from that round. You are gone from the entire match. So if you get a red card early on, uh, you'll miss all three rounds and your team will be without you completely. Uh, so, And then certain fouls will also result in a player being sent back a zone. That's a penalty that goes along with some of this stuff. Some, It seems like some of them don't immediately get the push back a zone as well. But anyway, we move on. So uh, another thing is just, I suppose, with injuries and also like changing of players. If a player is injured during a match, they are not replaced by any sort of substitute. The team must continue on down a player. Teams are allowed to change their team makeup between matches, but not during matches. So this is why basically Cora was able to join the Fire Ferrets and their pro bending team in that she didn't take over when Hasuk, you know, quit. Hasuk quit in between matches, so they weren't playing when Hasuk quit. So they were allowed to get a new water bender because they knew going into the next match that they had this is the waterbender. So the idea is that there's no substitutions basically allowed during games here, which is an interesting rule for sure. Um, next up, uh, we'll go into the tournament structure here. So the aim of pro and every pro bending team is to qualify for the pro bending championship tournament. This is a 16 team knockout tournament uh, bracket basically. Um, and it's kind of winner take all. Uh, the league uh, all play matches against each other and then the, then the 16 teams with the best records uh, qualify for the tournament. We don't know a lot about the specific qualifying structure, like how many teams are there, how exactly does the league work. Is it like uh, a lot of sports where it's like uh, uh, three points for a win, uh, you can't tie zero points for a loss or, or what. Um, but the idea with, like, say, the Fire Ferrets, for example, is that... Uh, in episode two, they're, they they have to win two matches to qualify for the tournament. And it's specifically noted that it, it is a league structure. So um, the idea seems to be that their record was such that if they won two games, they would guarantee their spot in the top 16, but it was close. So it gives the idea that the Firefarts just kind of snuck in there as being like potentially like the 16th uh, team, 
which I, I don't know how many teams there are. Uh, we only know about like just over 16 teams. So um, is it just a couple that miss out or do a lot miss out? Like just how large is the league uh, for like 16 teams to make it to the kind of uh, the finals basically. So um, that's, it, it's definitely an interesting one. I'd like to know more about just that that general structure but it does seem like it is basically a sort of a regular season type thing and then the playoffs basically is, is right at the end so um the 16 uh, tournament teams all have to ante up 30,000 yuans for the championship prize this means that the winning team wins 480,000 yuans uh, it seems like it is a winner takes all type thing here uh, in addition to of course being named the pro bending champions of course, that's what they're all after. Um, so next thing that we go into is just known pro bending champions. We don't actually know a ton about the history of the sport in the grand scheme of things. All we know is that the White, Wa- the White Falls Wolfbats are, are the four-time winners, um, but a lot of that is somewhat questionable in that they use cheating tactics. So how many of those are actually earned or what? Uh, the last one at the very least we know they cheated their way to victory and realistically that last one probably is the fire ferret's victory but it will be remembered in history as the wolf bats winning that one as much as we want to debate it the black quarry porcupines uh, are the known as the longest reigning champions in the history of the sport this means that they would have had to have won over four times in a row so at least five in a row at some point in their history this was when Toza was on the team and um, if not more than that so they could be you know five six seven time champions in a row and eventually that streak was broken uh, and that's kind of where they are right now and um, the F- the fire ferrets never actually won the pro bending championship but they did win a charity pro bending tournament which was structured in basically the exact same way as the initial pro bending championship uh, and this uh, help was was done in order to raise money to rebuild the city in the aftermath of book two. So the Firefighters won that championship, and because all the main teams participated in it, like it, it it is, I suppose, more or less the equivalent of them winning a championship because they went up against like the exact same competition. So you know the Firefighters do have a notable like victory within the sport. Uh, I think is is the main thing to talk about there. Now let's get into the list of teams. Now ultimately we don't know a lot of details about most of these teams. But here is all of the, the teams that we do know about. So we have the Bossing Say Badger Moles, the Black Quarry Borcupines, the Bowling Buzzard Wasps, the Capital City Cat Gators, the Ember Island Eel Hounds, the Future Industries Fire Ferrets, the Golden Temple Tiger Dillos, Harbour Town Hog Monkeys, Kalayo Komodo Rhinos, Laogai Lion Vultures, Mose um, Mongoose Lizards, Makapu Moose Lines, Orchard uh, Gardens, Ostrich Horses, uh, Pinnacle Palace Platypus Bears, Red Sands Rabaroos, Rhino Lines, uh, White Falls Wolf Bats, and the Zhao Yao um, Zebra Frogs. So, um, w- there's, there's only a few teams that we know any sort of uh, kind of information about as such uh, in terms of like the the names of the teams and stuff like that so I'll just while we're still on this slide uh, we'll cover some of the interesting things going on here um, in terms of uh, names of the teams and also I suppose locations as well so um, obviously we have uh, Bossing Say so there is a team that kind of I suppose hail from Bossing Say which is quite interesting Black Quarry is the Borcupines. Uh, we don't actually know what that is. We don't know if it's like a company, is it like a mining company, or is it a specific place in like the Earth Kingdom? That's not something we know about. Baoling is clearly the name of some sort of city, but I don't think we know anything about what it is. Capital City, uh, for the most part, would be probably considered the Fire Nation capital city, but again, we're not entirely sure of that. You know, the Cat Gator, I think, is considered more of an Earth Kingdom animal, so. What is what are they directly talking about there? Ember Island Eelhound, so we know Ember Island uh, very well. It's one of the Fire Islands, so that makes complete sense. Fire Ferrets, uh, or the, I think they do have a kind of secondary name as like the Republic City Fire Ferrets, so they are kind of like a hometown team, basically. The Golden Temple uh, Tiger Dillos are also known as the... Um, Two Zin Tiger Dillos, and Two Zin is the name of the town where the 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 action scene from the chase uh, takes place, uh, if I remember correctly. 
so this is that sort of um, abandoned town um, and this is where the big you know standoff with Zuko, Iroh, Azula and everyone took place so this is kind of where their team is uh, named after which I, I think is a uh, pretty pretty interesting um harbor town hog monkeys again that could be the harbor of pretty much anywhere we're not entirely sure kalao um komodo rhinos kalao it, it refers to the kalao mountain range which is the mountain range where the cave of two lovers is so it's sort of near omashu so that that's an interesting one there laogai of course we know lake laogai um uh, is what that's referring to uh, the Mose is the Mose Sea which is a sea it's basically the sea between the Fire Nation and the Earth Kingdom that sort of uh, general area so that's what that's referring to uh, Makapu is obviously Mount Makapu which is the fortune teller place uh, Orchard Gardens um, again it could be a gardens it could be like a restaurant or something like that we, we're not exactly sure same goes for the Pinnacle Palace we don't really know what that is Red Sands Rabaroos that's referring to uh, Red Sands Island which was mentioned as being an island where Boomy was sort of uh, had his forces uh, before they arrived before they were about to arrive uh, at the end of the book one finale so that is a place we know about it seems to be um uh, one of these islands that's somewhat near Republic City. Uh, Rhino Lines are just very briefly mentioned at the start of uh, book two. They're a new team, so they might not have a sponsor, just a kind of uh, animal name. White Falls, we don't actually know what it is. Uh, is it a place or what? We don't know. And similarly, uh, Zhao Yao, we don't actually know either. Um, so as for the teams we know a little bit about... Um, We'll start with the Red Sands Rabaroos, and, and a lot of this comes from the Pro Bending uh, Arena game, where at least they give you a little bit of flavor text towards uh, kind of what's going on here. So uh, we get the names of all of the team members. I think in this case, the three uh, characters on this team are all given names in the show. So we have Adi, who is the team captain, Ula, and Umi. And the idea about this team is that you know they're the only all-female Pro Bending team, uh, and um, the other thing about them is that they're known for being very quick, having really, really good teamwork. Uh, and that's really the, the main focus on them. Uh, th th again, it's sort of game mechanics here about trying to give them a little bit of personality. But uh, it just talks about how they coordinate to unleash rapid fire, flurry of elemental attacks, um, lightning fast bending, action packed. That's really just what all that's really talked about here. Uh, the Black Quarry Borcupines. Um, uh, otherwise known as the uh, bullies of Black Quarry, um, their kind of speciality is sort of uh, relentless pressure in that they, they really can uh, put a lot of teams under pressure to kind of make mistakes and really force through a victory. They're kind of a more veteran team. They've had a lot of success in the past, of course, so they are definitely one of the more dangerous teams out there and they're kind of known for sort of playing rough but on the more kind of fair side of things and um, so that's what they're sort of known for uh, and of course their team is made up of uh, Shui, uh, Zin and Chang. Chang of course being I think the new team captain who replaced uh, Toza so he's Toza's replacement as the earthbender on the team. Uh, next we have the Baoling buzzard wasps and the idea with them is that they sort of have this kind of uh, pressure point kind of type style. They go for uh, accurate strikes against their opponent rather than brute force um, there's sort of a minor element of like I suppose trying to get the sort of chi blocking effect from them uh, and, and that's what they're trying to do in terms of strike in a such a way where that they will limit their opponents uh, in terms of like their chi and stuff like that and cause them to make mistakes and kind of lose energy um, and uh, you know it's specifically said here battling is in fact a location and their their um their members are called uh, Waterbender uh, Lung L O O N G Long. I don't really know how to say it. Sh Shan is the Earthbender, and Ko is the uh, Firebender. Um, and their their technique is called like the Sting technique specifically. Uh, next up we have the Golden Temple Tiger Dillos. Um, this is Kano, Haka, and uh, Yose. And uh, this is the veteran team. So this is this really long running team. It doesn't appear like they've ever got quite got the victory, but they've always been there and thereabouts. And 
the idea with them is that they're not as athletic anymore but they make up for that with how you know wise in a way that the, their veteran status that they can use these sort of wily moves as veterans to get their advantage um and uh, it's it's it the idea with them is basically that they never go down easily so you know just a fun little thing here which is you know developing the different types of teams one's kind of more on the rough side of things one's quicker you know one's the all-female team you know little bits and pieces kind of going on there uh the the wolf bats of course white falls wolf bats um are um I suppose they're primarily known for their, you know, cheating type play that they have going on, that they um, they do that to their advantage, and while they are skilled, that they can, you know, beat people, I suppose, without the cheating, they will resort to that when they need to, and that's their sort of uh, gimmick as a team, and... Their team makeup is that they, of course, have their captain, Tano, Earthbender, Ming, and Firebender, Shaozu. Um, so that's, for the most part, all there really is to say there. And then, like, a lot of the other teams, like, we see a couple of them in the show um, actually get a chance to sort of, um, you know, th- we see them kind of minorly on screen, but um, we get no real detail specifically on you know how that team necessarily operates and so on so if you've played like the Korra uh, video game and stuff like that you get to see a couple of these I think extra teams as well but for the most part the, the, we don't know a lot of information about kind of some of this stuff so um that's that's kind of the, the the main thing to say here just with regards to the teams um now, it is something I'd, I'd really like to see us kind of go back to at some point to, to get to learn more about some of these teams, about more of these characters, because I think it, it, it's, a, it's a cool idea. But that, that's it for, this, I suppose, this, is, this specific part of the information. So what we're going to do for the rest of the video is basically go into the more speculation side of the video. And that's going to focus on basically the speculation on, I suppose, how pro bending uh how prevalent is it in the world how exactly does this sport operate within the world um and that's what we're going to talk about next okay so getting into this speculation about i suppose the origins of the game and then how it sort of has grown in the avatar world so we specifically know the one piece of information we really know about the origin of the game is that it does have its origins in republic city which obviously means that it is a relatively new game. Uh, just by, especially just based on the fact that like we we're not specifically told all that much about like pre that many previous champions and stuff like that. I think another little fact that we have is that I think from one of the art books it mentions that their idea is that like in the very early days of the game they didn't initially wear like the protective like helmets and padding and stuff like that. So, um. I get the impression the game probably doesn't have like that long of a history that like it's it's probably maybe 20 30 years at most I'd be shocked if it goes further than that and like it has over 50 years of history I I do very much get the impression it is on the sort of uh, newer ends of things and that's why we have what only what seems like the equivalent of like just over maybe just a so, somewhere in or around like there's like been 10 previous winners but it's been a lot of like oh this team's won four this team's won like six seven in a row um so um you know th- th- that's basically most of the information but th- the question comes in is that like in the comics right now we have the formation of cranefish town which is going to become republic city and obviously the idea here is that things are changing with the different nations coming together um to kind of create this kind of new hybrid place where it has elements of all of the cultures so naturally with the main uh, places coming together being the water tribe the earth kingdom and the fire nation why wouldn't a sport related to the elements of them kind of come up uh, i think again cranefish tan and imbalance is giving us this idea that uh, benders in a way with the advancement of technology um at least in that book, are frustrated with the lack of, I suppose, things for them to do. They feel sort of like technology is passing them by. But of course, there's 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 one thing that sort of in a way like technology can't necessarily do, and that is, you know, a sport like this. It 
uh, this sort of a sport it only works when you have actual you know human benders of these elements doing it so um if not just to have something more for benders to do i could see sort of why a sport would develop we have some minor history of sport in the avatar world with like the airbenders playing like airball i think the mention of sky bison racing comes up at some point uh, and and um you sort of get that idea. I think Wayne Wing make their own sort of like uh, metal bending sort of speedball type thing as well later on. And so um, you sort of see that like, okay, so sports, uh, we're, it's not explored all that much in the Avatar world about like, are the standard sports that we have also present over there? Like, do they do, you know, you know, athletics and stuff like that or what? Or is it specifically that the benders get to do a lot of the, the sporting stuff? Uh, we do know this is racing. That that is one thing. You know, motorsport uh, does seem to be a thing that is uh, at least in the last while come into play. So uh, th- there is some suggestions that it's there's more than just pro bending as a, as sports in the, in the Avatar world. Um, so you get a sense of like, okay, it, it must have it, like given that we know that little fact about uh, them starting without the protective padding. An idea to create a more regulated form of like bending combat that wouldn't really result in people getting hurt. So immediately like creating zones and it being more of a zone advantage rather than like doing damage to your opponent. And I, I think there's probably heavy, heavy inspiration from Earth Rumble with the idea of like an arena and you know, victory by like t- throwing your opponent off in that case the side or the back but in this case okay just the back of the arena uh, but sort of placing limitations on just how kind of crazy you can go with bending so it's more about skill rather than just raw power level whereas earth rumble was just kind of crazy at times and that's why like someone like a Toph was able to sort of uh, dominated with like her sheer kind of skill and power whereas like Toph would maybe be a little bit more limited in a pro bending environment and um, so again it's hard to really speculate on the exact specifics of how everything really came about but obviously if they wanted to turn into more of a kind of professional thing naturally they'd be like okay it is a little bit dangerous as it is now let's bring in introduce some of those rules about like headshots let's wear helmets let's wear protective padding so we can actually play this game uh, for more than a couple of times and so you, it gives you an idea of like why it will become this sort of big notable entertainment event within Republic City and why over time you know it would probably develop a following different teams forming crowds beginning to come and it becoming more and more professional to the point where eventually they decide to create an arena a full-on arena for this um, again, that's sort of the thing that I'd like to know in, in terms of uh, a lot of the speculation for this video that I was asked to do was um, talk more about like how exactly it sort of works in terms of like where are the other arenas in the world? There's no way there's only one pro bending arena. Even if there's only one just like that where it's like suspended that high, the giant ring of water and stuff like that, there has to be some other smaller arenas out there somewhere because like the game doesn't inherently need you to fall off the side into water um even if it's just like chalk on the ground once it's i suppose measured out properly you can still play the game exactly as it is you know m- maybe yeah there's some limitation on the fact that like you can actually hang off the side of the arena as we saw with the fire ferrets but like i suppose for the lower levels of it like do you really need it to be that case and then especially i suppose most notably with earthbenders around it's probably relatively easy for you you immediately just to play a game would need two earthbenders for those two earthbenders to just be like okay you've drawn the arena pattern on the ground let's just lift this up a couple of feet into the air and um, so that immediately creates this sort of uh you know fall off thing and even if they don't necessarily have water you know maybe they can do padding on the kind of outside the arena or just not have it be that big of a drop or something like that um but you know it gives you the idea that like just earthbenders existing allows you to sort of have arenas sort of in a way on the go whenever wherever you want basically um so i think that that's an important uh thing to keep in mind in terms of, I suppose, the wider world, obviously it starts in Republic City, but news would eventually, you know, you know, feed out to the other nations. Uh, 
and knowledge of this sport would happen. The 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 issue, I suppose, would be that like it, it's mainly Republic City that has become the sort of everyone lives here. Whereas like the Water Tribes, um, as far as we're aware, it still is mainly just Water Tribe people there. Um, it seems like the Earth Kingdom in general has sort of become more of the place where there's like there's a little bit of everyone. I think the Fire Nation probably is still primarily Fire Nation people. As I said, Water Tribes still Water Tribe people. So. It might be more difficult for the game to properly take off there in that anyone who would want to be a pro bender from the Fire Nation or the Water Tribes would realistically have to go to the Earth Kingdom or specifically Republic City to try and start a career. Which, you know, in, in a way is this kind of positive of the sport in that because the rules require you to have a Firebender, an Earthbender, and a Waterbender on your team, it requires you to actually go out and kind of meet someone from the different nations and so the the game in general has this sort of uh, idea of bringing people together just like incorporated into it so say so say take a team like the red sands rabaroos the all-female team you know it, it it's 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 like red sands and stuff like that and so it, it's kind of like okay that seems like a fire island type thing you know around the the vicinity of uh Republic City. So is that where Adi is from, given that she's the team captain? So where did she meet uh, the other two girls to be on the team? And, you know, was she friends with them beforehand or did she come to Republic City and then meet them there? And that's where they formed their team. That That's, I suppose, the, probably the, the big question in all of this is just for some of these people, like, it must be somewhat difficult to just find your other team members if you're not directly from Republic City, which I suppose realistically probably brings up the idea that there is probably some level of training just to be a pro bender with regards to the style that you need to to do. Um and maybe it's it, it almost takes just going to Republic City to be actually able to get involved in your first couple of games. But there has to be a sort of entry level to the sport. Um, and I suppose this is probably where you maybe get into how bending is like thought. Like if, if you're a kid and you discover you have bending, like say you live in Republic City, how do you actually go about learning your bending style in that uh, is it a master you type thing where you go to some sort of academy kind of like a kind of karate class uh is, are you taught by your parents or in more modern times is there a more like modern style of like beginners like teaching an element so it, <coughs> it might incorporate the more modern style of just pro bending is probably actually a decent way to develop someone into a bender while having kind of control because you're teaching them to do like quick controlled blasts rather than all out kind of crazy power type stuff so um that that's where i think it's it's actually really interesting to 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 discuss in that like is there anywhere in the water tribe a pro bending arena like there probably is somewhere in that like it would be this cool idea of like an ice style pro bending arena and it just is is it is something a little bit different where like you know you, you've got your standard arena where it's even grand for everyone but then here's like an ice arena where it suits maybe waterbenders a little bit more and and so on uh i don't really know if that's the case but i, I suppose it's it's waterbenders maybe having to practice and not having the ideal situation and equipment and then i suppose equipment is another interesting thing in that it seems like basically all of the gear is identical apart from the color so it gives you the idea that maybe there's only one manufacturer in the entire avatar world who makes those helmets who makes the protective gear and the kind of boots and so on so that's probably some other republic city uh company that makes them um which i i'd like to know about like I, it it doesn't seem like it's cabbage corp it doesn't seem like it's future industries or um uh, Coom Enterprises or whatever it's called so it'd be it'd be fun to see that just like a sportswear manufacturer type thing uh, in the Avatar world and you know who runs that company and so on it probably realistically would be maybe one of the original founders of the game who would maybe was the one to suggest the protective gear in the first place and so it gives a, a little bit of history to the to the sport I suppose um, and then of course yeah you have the 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 pro bending arena itself um it obviously has training areas in it and, like it has a gym with the idea that 
it seems like there are specific times that you know different teams get to use the gym and so on and it just happens that Mako and Bolin live up there because like Toza seems to be very heavily involved in it and so on so um it it does seem like it, at least on that professional level when you're in the league um you do base all of what you do around the one arena and I suppose just with the way that the league works and the games aren't too long you could have everything based solely around that one arena but I suppose I suppose the main question is like how do you actually qualify to get into the league in that like Mako, Bolin and Hasuk as like a, an initial team entering this like they had to be there and thereabouts because they, they're two victories away from and qualifying for the end game tournament so what qualified them to even be in the league in the first place and it, it could potentially give you the idea that maybe it is a sport where it's actually fairly rare to form a team that pretty much if you get a bunch of the if you have the equipment and you get your team together you can pretty much enter it if you want and it is as much as it's called pro bending it is more of maybe an amateur sport it's it, it's, it's it's difficult to to exactly say exactly how it operates and so on and um like can any kid go out and join like a pro bending club and train and uh, kind of have that sort of system to get them to being on a pro bending team and like how exactly that operates because clearly sponsors get involved in this in that a, a bunch of the the main pro bending teams are either named after a location or a company um which gives you the idea that there's a sort of business aspect to this and especially that sort of links in with the fact that there is a little bit of kind of shady kind of gangster business going on in the pro bending arena and how it operates uh Obviously, the whole Toza situation with kind of how he came to, I suppose, meet Mako and Bolin. There's like bribery involved in in all of that and kind of corruption, and then just the, um, you know, wh- when they win the, their prize money for getting into the tournament, and then uh, Butaka like takes it away from the firefighters. It's kind of like that seems kind of unfair. That like the way the sport is run, uh, like the competitors unless they win the big one really don't like win enough to sort of uh really consider it be to be like professional as such that's why like mako has to also have that job and so on to to even get the money to enter the tournament uh without uh getting a sponsor so um you know it, it, i think that's probably what gives you the biggest sense of that it probably still is in its somewhat early stages in that like it is one of the biggest kind of things in the world, but it also I do get the sense that just that sort of entertainment industry, sports style stuff, uh, outside of like just the like say Ember Island uh, players kind of theater type stuff, this more modern stuff of like the movers coming into play and this arena for everyone to watch this and it be very public knowledge rather than the sort of underground sport of like uh, earth rumble which was kind of more of a kind of pro wrestling style thing almost and then the way earth rumble kind of seems to be in like chorus time where it seems to be more of like the mma equivalent um, and not as public um it is i think somewhat interesting but um yeah i think this is where i'm going to end off the discussion with uh you know presenting this discussion to you all to speculate on in the comments how do you think the avatar world the, the system around pro bending works uh do you think there are like organizations in the different nations that uh like organize the sport there or do you think it is just a case of like pro bending is just really well known and the people who are really passionate about it get into it by going to Republic City to be there in the heart of everything that's happening. Like, is it even possible for you to to have, like, a, a, a minor pro-bending league in the Water Tribe or something like that? Um, again, the, the trickiness of all of this is that it's probably... It's probably a bit of a rare occurrence to just, like, in the Water Tribe, especially, like, say, the Southern Water Tribe, to just, like, have two firebenders and two earthbenders there with two waterbenders who want to be on a team and have just a single match happen in the water tribe so you know i I, i'm very interested in the organization of this and kind of how it works but um i think the final topic to discuss in this before we end is uh, specifically 
now that there are more airbenders in the world, will pro bending be adapted in any way to accommodate airbenders? Will airbenders ever be allowed to play pro bending? And um, I think it's a very interesting discussion because now that airbenders are coming back and there's much more than the world, it probably should be the case. I do wonder about in terms of the balance of the game if airbenders just being on a team would be kind of too powerful because the thing you mainly associate with airbending is sort of the sort of a knockback kind of aspect of the element of just if you you know go for a really powerful air blast you will send someone flying and it's much more of a like huge effect than say oh I'm going to hit someone with an earth disc and they'll fly back more or less the distance of one zone I'll hit someone with a one second fire blast and that will do you know this much damage and so on with airbending though the idea is that like I could see like a way especially if it it remains three people like you just make sure you have an airbender on your team at all times because you get one direct hit on anyone who doesn't dodge it completely and you'll probably send them back zones and so unless they heavily heavily restricted airbenders I would sort of be a little bit kind of uh, questioning in terms of just would they sort of be too overpowered for the game in terms of just directly accomplishing what's happening here because the sort of knockback aspect pushback aspect of the other elements is almost like a secondary thing of just like the firebenders have the heat and it just happens to have a bit of a knockback effect the water bending thing again it's more of a like okay you're gonna hit them with water and there's a certain kind of kinetic aspect to it but it's not the main thing whereas with the air it feels like any notable airbender who can like train well enough to make sure that their air blasts you know send people push back enough and that said maybe that's me um overestimating how easy it is for an airbender to generate the power to actually knock someone back Maybe it would be a little fairer. Uh, Maybe the way that they do it would be that, you know, airbending sort of like pro-bending style adaptation would mean that the quicker blast that they have to do wouldn't be as like crazy heavy knockback. But um, that would maybe make it fairer. I Just what the way the arena is right now, I think it would probably be a bit too chaotic to just be like four. Like you're allowed to just have four members on the team. I The way I could maybe see them doing it is that the way they incorporate it now is that yes, you do have four member teams. But only three members participate in, um, in a round at any specific point. And you, the, the rules will be changed so that like everyone's going to play at least two rounds i suppose that doesn't actually work because you can actually do a full knockout um so uh i I suppose you probably maybe account for that and be like okay the knockouts are rare enough so if you if 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 a game goes into a second round you have to make one substitution basically so that means each player more or less gets to as long as a match goes to a second round everyone gets a chance to be involved in a round so you have to be very strategic about okay this is my opening three players and then in the second round we'll sub out the firebender put in the airbender and go from there and you have to keep doing that with the substitutions uh, that's one way i could see that being done or just maybe make it a little bit more standard and introduce the idea of like okay you you have you can you have you have to have a team of all four elements and you just have to choose one person to be your sort of substitute but that they then incorporate like just maybe a substitute rule into the game where like at any point during a round or match you can choose to use that substitution but they're in for the rest of that match or whatever um again i i think it ultimately depends on like with regards to balance power level if airbenders would be considered overpowered given what pro bending is trying to accomplish or not um now like because uh, I, I can see some airbenders being interested in this um and you know there's always the opportunity of like do they just do it like very simply you you choose a team of three they have to be three different elements but it doesn't matter which. So they, they take away the restriction that's currently in place in the game where you have to have one waterbender, one earthbender, one firebender. Instead, you just have to have three different elements, um, but air is now suddenly included in that. So you almost have to make the decision of, on your team of three, which element do you not 
include. Um, so, uh, yeah, so again, it comes back to that power level thing, but I, I fundamentally don't see anything too crazy in terms of them needing to change the game all that much to incorporate airbenders. Um, obviously, some restrictions on airbenders would probably be, be like... Um, you again you would have this, this streaming rule of like you're they're not allowed to blast you with air for more than a second air air strikes to the head would be allowed um as far as i'm aware um um and then you would probably maybe have to do some sort of a restriction about like um how how much sort of wind assisted air assisted like jumping or flying about the place that they can do uh, otherwise, like they might be too, like uh, too difficult to hit almost because they're already fairly evasive with just the the way their technique works. Um, but you know, you you could see the idea of like air bending. I think does fit in actually quite well. Um, in that it, it it would work, I suppose, sort of like a mix of fire and water bending rules, and that like the head strikes are allowed, but for the most part like the the wind is generated by the the airbender themselves so um yeah uh th that's definitely another thing in the comments for you guys to kind of talk about uh how do you think they could incorporate airbending into pro bending do you think it would be complicated or not um or anything like that yeah that's been uh, the video uh thanks for watching and bye also, thanks again to uh, Brittany for supporting me on Patreon and uh, choosing this topic for this week. Uh, and uh, you'll see here on screen uh, my thank you to all my kind of current uh, patrons. So if you want to choose a topic for me to do in this format, the Avatar Discussion Topic format or Avatar Explained format, uh, if you come in on my Patreon at the uh, $5 tier, you do get to choose a topic for one of these videos. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, definitely check the Patreon link in the description below for the full details on that and all the different tiers and stuff like that that are available. So yes, thanks again to my Patreons for supporting my channel and allowing uh, specific videos like this to happen that I might not have got to by myself.